start of a new season as uh, folks are headed back to school and uh, at lots of different kinds of schools as teachers or students. And uh, we have a special prayer time today that um, is really directed towards uh, the blessing of people who are going back to school. So whether, whether you're a teacher or a staff member or a student, we want, to, we want to pray with you today and ask God's blessings upon your endeavors. We welcome each and every person who's here today. If, uh, if you're here today as a guest and uh, we don't have regular touch with you, we would love to have a way to get in touch with you. If you can fill out one of the cards that are in front of you and drop it in the offering plate as it goes by, uh, we'd love to have your contact information. Today, our gospel scripture finds Jesus uh, bringing healing to a woman who's been sick for a long, long time. And uh, he brings both healing and freedom to her. So we're going to be um, paying attention to the scriptures today and we're gonna be uh, looking for healing in our own lives as well. Let's, uh, let's all sing together and uh, enjoy a great morning in Christ's presence. Jason? Uh, yeah, if y'all will stand uh, with us, if you're able, we'll start with uh, Gather Us In, which is printed in your bulletin, and right after that, we'll sing God's Holy Ways Are Just and True, number 328. Here in this place a new light is streaming now is the darkness vanished away see in this space our fears and our dreamings brought to you, you in the light of this day gather us in the lost and forsaken gather us in the blind and the lame Call to us now and we shall awaken, we shall arise at the sound of your name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery, we are the old who will yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty, gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly, give us the rich to enter the song. take the wine and the water here we will take the bread of new birth here you shall all your sons and your daughters call to new to be salt for the earth gather drink the wine of compassion give us to eat the bread that is us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place a new light is shining, now is the kingdom and now is the day. Gather us in to hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all people together, fire of love in our flesh and our bones.
God's holy ways are just and true. His promises are ever new. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Let every heart with praises sing and make His house with voices ring. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. to mind is grace and love our needs provided from above oh praise him alleluia he kept his word and jesus came to make a people for his name oh praise him of old, the story of our mighty God. Oh, praise Him, alleluia, for all His works and other days. We shall rejoice through endless days. we've come to attention before your throne. We bless you and thank you for the goodness of this past week. We lift up our hearts to sing praises to you today. We pray, O oh Lord, that today as the scriptures are read, that they might come alive in our hearts and our lives today. We pray, O oh Lord, as we gather around your table to eat and drink, that we might find healing and freedom, forgiveness. And we ask, O oh God, that in everything that is said and done this morning, that all the glory and the honor and the goodness might be raised up to you. We thank you and bless you for this morning. And we open up ourselves to the presence of your Holy Spirit. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let's listen now to the word of the Lord. Our first reading today is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they will come and they will set each one his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem and against all its walls round about and against all the cities of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on them concerning all their wickedness, whereby they have forsaken me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. Now, gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all which I commanded you. Do not be dismayed before them or I will dismay you before them. Now behold, I have made you today as a fortified city and as a pillar of iron and as walls of bronze against the whole land to the kings of Judah, to its princes, to its priests, and to the people of the land. They will fight against you, but 
They will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Our Psalms today is from chapter 71, verses 1 through 6, and we'll read this with my side reading the uh, regular text and uh, Pastor Tim's side reading the bold text. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Our New Testament reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 18, verses, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verses 18 through 29. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word would be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
you'll turn in your bulletins to uh, the litany for uh, blessing of, of folks who are going back to school. We're going to start our prayer time with this, and then Bruce uh, will come forward and, and lead our pastoral prayer. So uh, if you'll pray and read the darker text, let's, let's pray this prayer. God is our students return to the rhythm of the school year. We ask for blessing upon them. That they may learn and grow. That they may make and be good friends. That they may have their minds opened. That their hearts may be soft. That they may be protected from evil. That they may be filled with love. As they make independent decisions each day. As they work and play, be with them. as they relate to other people, be with them. as they navigate tricky situations, be with them. as they confront their own hearts, be with them. for their teachers, we pray for endless wells of patience, pray be so. wisdom and insight into each child. Creativity and abundant resources. Let it be so. Blessings on earth and in the spirit. Let it be so. We know that safety is never guaranteed for anyone. So we ask for it anyway. That your angels would guard them and keep them. That kind people would surround them. Give us wisdom as we raise and teach them. To encourage creativity and open-mindedness. And to love and welcome them wholeheartedly. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, Lord of heaven and earth, we, your people, meeting here on the banks of Buffalo Creek, come to you with great gratitude and humility. We are humbled by the thought of us sinners coming boldly into the presence of the righteous God. And we are grateful that through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you have extended to us the invitation to come to you, bringing our accomplishments and our failures. And so, as best we can, we present ourselves to you in worship, thanking you for your grace and bringing to you our needs and the needs of people we love. We thank you for the beauty of our surroundings. We thank you for the beauty of this congregation and the love for one another and for the world. We thank you for our missionaries who, in different parts of the world, are praying and preaching for you. We thank you for this opportunity to bless those who are starting school again and their teachers and staffs. And we ask for your blessing on those who are in grief today, on those whose health is precarious, on those who are in pain of one kind and another, and we pray, O oh God, that you, in your mercy, would be with them and that you would heal and comfort and strengthen those who need you so much. We pray, O oh Lord, also that our presence, our thoughts, our voices, and our fellowship here today will bring honor to you through our Lord Jesus Christ who taught his disciples to pray in these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together as we listen to the gospel. Our gospel reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, but not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated. And the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. The word of the Lord. Um, our communion song is a new one. Um, so I will sing uh, the refrain in the first verse and then go back to the top and repeat it. Um, feel free to join in as soon as you uh, um, get familiar. Thank mm -hmm. you.
for 18 years. Her spirit companion piled more and more on her until the sky became a stranger and she knew her neighbors by their feet rather than their faces. 18 years. For some of us here, that is longer than our marriages, our careers, academic or otherwise, longer even than our lives. It is long enough not to remember what it was like before the pain set in. It becomes an assumption you make about your life going into the future. The leader of the synagogue in our gospel story had a point. What's one more day? It's easy, you know. It's easy to let your spirit weigh you down, bend you, twist you. It's easy to let pain linger, to think it's all in your head, to blame yourself for the way you feel, to feel that you somehow deserve it, to be broken so long you can't remember how it felt to be yourself, to assume this is who you are and how life is. It's easy not to seek help. It's as easy as reducing religion to rules and God to a referee. Went to church on Sunday, point. Prayed, another point. Sang some songs, point. Took communion, point. Listened to the sermon, double points. <laughs> the scorecard complete, you are all right for another week. Jesus, however, doesn't make it easy for anyone, the spiritually defeated or the know-it-alls. Teaching in the synagogue, he reminded the people gathered of the meaning of the Sabbath. According to Exodus, the Sabbath was the rest God took to bask in the joy of creation. According to Deuteronomy, we celebrate the Sabbath in remembrance of God freeing his people from slavery. It's the day we participate with God in the wonder and beauty of creation, including ourselves. You are, without a doubt, a wonder. You are beautiful even if you prefer to be called handsome or are uncomfortable applying either term to yourself. You are beloved by the Almighty, and there is nothing you can do to change that. To whatever binds us, Jesus answers, not one more day. Jesus tears up our checklist religion and declares freedom. Freedom from cookie cutter spirituality. Freedom from self-serving doctrinaire religion, as John Green puts it. Freedom from trying to impress God or win the approval of others with our vast theological knowledge or moral perfectionism. What can we possibly do to impress the maker of galaxies and violets? Nothing, of course. Why did God send his son? To teach and correct, to be sure, but to demonstrate that God desires us to thrive, to be holy ourselves. Our Father in heaven wants us to be happy, to, be, to stand tall, to approach the past with compassion and forgiveness and the future with hope, to be free, and to invest a lifetime learning to live into that freedom and work toward the freedom of others and the whole of creation. He came to remind us that we are family and our Father loves us despite of it all and simply because that is what a good parent does. As daughters and sons of Abraham by faith, as family, Jesus calls us to the table because he wants to. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you. He took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he did the same with the cup after, say, after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is my blood 
of the new covenant. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the love that makes us family. Thank you for the concern you place in our hearts for each other that comes with that love. Thank you for this bread by which we, we remember your abiding, saving, and healing presence among us. Thank you for this cup by which you fill the present and future with your own hope for us all. Thank you that you wanted to be with us. Thank you for the work of joy, courage, and compassion required to live as free people, and, to, and that you are the strength and refreshment for that work. By your spirit, straighten our bent spirits, and let us stand aright as your beloved children. We pray this in the ever-loving name of Jesus. gifts of God for the people of God. Take and eat.
the nature of love, to give, to give out of compassion, to give, because it's just good to give sometimes, <laughs> um, to give out of love.
please accept these offerings from us, multiply them, that they may take your good news throughout the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Hearing the story as a child, the story from the gospel text of Jesus healing a woman on the Sabbath, uh, I had a hard time understanding the indignation of the synagogue leader than I did believing in the possibility of Jesus curing the crippled woman. I could wrap my head around an all-powerful, all-loving God wanting to bring healing. I couldn't understand how a worshiper of God could be so upset when such a healing took place right in his midst. You think, hey, win-win, no harm, no foul. But the older I get, the more I witness people in positions of power and authority becoming agitated and disgruntled when some other entity made a decision or exercises authority. When I look at the political landscape today, it doesn't matter if we're looking at the right-leaning conservative or the left-leaning liberal the only good decision is the decision that their side makes. And every decision the other side makes has to be contested and resisted at all costs. Unfortunately, religious institutions are no exception to this struggle for control. The will to power and dominance can find its way into our most sacred spaces and gatherings. However, in our gospel text this, mon this morning, the context for authority plays out in a radically different way than it does in our present day corridors of power. Here we see the interesting dynamic of power playing out between Jesus and the crippled woman and the synagogue leader. And Jesus not only graciously encounters the woman and confronts the religious authorities in this text, but Jesus continues to encounter us and challenge our institutional dynamics, maybe today even more than the first century. I want to highlight two questions we can draw from this text and then pose to our church and our current context, both this community as well as the church throughout this land. The first question that I see and I hear in this text is, do our worshiping communities perpetuate and protect spirits of, of oppression, either consciously or unconsciously? Or do our worshiping communities liberate people from these powers? This woman had a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. And while the synagogue was not responsible for bending her back towards the ground, its leaders were actively guarding against her liberation and it seems other people's liberation as well. The synagogue leader says, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. It's almost as if the synagogue leader is standing in between Jesus and the crowd and say, nobody else come and see this guy. You all, you can come to this guy six other days of the week to be healed, but don't come to this guy on this day. In other words, the synagogue leader believed that the oppressing forces of this world are not to be confronted or challenged within their religious gatherings. But Jesus seems to be at ease within this socially awkward confrontation. Both the synagogue leader and Jesus utilize power and authority. It's not that power and authority are evil in and of themselves. It's how they are using power and authority. And Jesus utilizes power and authority in three very unique ways. So unique that you might have passed over it and missed it. What's the first thing that Jesus does? First, he sees her. Some texts say, behold, a woman who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Jesus sees her. He notices her. Jesus beholds the woman whose gaze is perpetually bent towards the dust. She does not, seem her, she does not see her redeemer. 
but her Redeemer sees her. Second, he pronounces her free with the authority and power of his word. He liberates her. And then third, he lays his hand on her and touches her with the compassion of not only his divinity, but also his humanity. These are three very practical ways, three very practical applications of liberation that the Holy Spirit is in empowering us to continue in this context in our day. The Holy Spirit empowers us to extend this kind of liberating, this kind of liberation, these in these kinds of ways. First, to see the oppressed as well as the power structures that oppress them. Then to utter words of liberation as well as words of confrontation. And then to embody grace with our physical, tangible actions. With regards to the seeing part, I see this as an act of prayer. When we pray, we are demonstrating, what we are demonstrating is that the things that we notice, certain things that we notice are worthy to be in our consciousness as well as the consciousness of God. When we see the brokenness around us and we come together as a community of Christ and we name things, that act of naming is participating in this act of Christ, of seeing, because we name what we see and we say something should change. This should not only be on our consciousness, but this should also, this is worthy to be on God's divine consciousness. And we are proclaiming to the world, this is what kind of people we are. This is what we notice. Prayer, as simple and benign as some people may see it, is a kind of beholding. It beholds God, and it also beholds the brokenness of creation. And it sees that creation through the eyes of Christ as things that are worthy to be lifted up to God for healing. And the wisdom of the Holy Spirit enables us not only to see the people and whose souls who have been bent by the oppressive forces of this world and has broken them, but the Holy Spirit also empowers us to lift them up to God for healing and liberation. We pray not merely for the individual's healing, but also for a liberation from the powers that bind them. And we say these powers are unjust and they will not function within the walls of a worshiping community. Also, with regards to prayer, we believe that God's work. How? We often don't have a clue. And that's another thing that is important to at least acknowledge. Our understanding of God is oftentimes in hindsight when we name the ways in which God is moving, but we can't always anticipate the ways in which God is at work. That is why we, we proclaim that we believe that God is at work and that God is living and active among us. And also when we name this, uh, name the brokenness and the, the, the things of this world that need to be seen by God, even though they don't see us noticing them, we notice them because we are reflecting the same character of our God. Our God sees those who do not necessarily have the strength to stand up straight and see God. And with regards to uttering words of liberation, woman, you are set free from your ailment. Jesus doesn't lead with confrontation. He leads with liberation. He says, not here. Here, we will not perpetuate the oppressive forces that bend people's back. And the language of Luke that Luke uses here in this gospel is not the language of healing, but the language of being set free of being untied. That's why Jesus references sections of the Torah of releasing animals and people are put to shame because they realize that the Torah has compassion for liberating animals and yet you don't want to liberate a woman towards restoration and healing. You'll untie an animal to go lead them to water, but you won't let a woman be untied for the, great, for the betterment of her, of her health. There are principalities and powers 
that bend the backs of people who enter the door of churches across the country. And these powers often go unchallenged and unnoticed. Powers like racism, sexism, nationalism, various forms of violence, forms of violence here in our own land, to our own bodies, to our own children, to bodies and people in lands abroad. Do we notice this kind of violence, both here and around the world? Do we challenge the suffocating problems of debt? Do we challenge and acknowledge the suffocating and brokenness, the suffocating ways in which we strangle our own earth and creation? Do we notice addictions to substances as well as addictions to distractions involving our own uses of entertainment and social media, which might seem like a small thing to note here, but those things hinder our ability to notice and to pay attention. And we can be tempted to say, six days a week we can talk about politics or social justice or some of these uh, cultural concerns, but on the Sabbath can we just talk about God? But if these powers are bending the backs of our people, then we have to utter words of liberation. You are set free, as well as words of comp confrontation. You hypocrites. You talk about liberation and freedom, and yet you perpetuate and let some of these forces continue within your midst. Because these are utterances of our Savior, both words of liberation and confrontation. And it's better to be wrong in our prophetic proclamation on behalf of the poor, oppressed, and marginalized than it is to be right and to be silent. And with regards to embodying grace, Jesus lays his hands on her. He touches her. He makes physical contact. There is a physicality to what we believe. It's not just in what we speak or the words that we have in our head, but it's a living, tangible reality. People with physical ailments in Jesus' day were often set apart from the community, and so Jesus' touch could be seen as scandalous even in and of itself, but it also was a physical sign of the divine reality that she was now physically connected with this community, and she was now restored rightfully to her ability to participate actively in this community. Restoring the social bonds was in and of itself worthy to give glory and thanks to God. Our society is becoming, I don't know if you've noticed, more and more fragmented, more and no more divisive. And this touch of Christ is a sign of integration and contact and wholeness. It is that kind of integration and wholeness that we strive for in our community. So in short, all of that to say, the one question that our gospel, the first question our gospel poses to us, do our worshiping communities perpetuate spirits of oppression or do they liberate people from these powers? Do we see people who are oppressed as well as those who are oppressing them? Are we speaking words of liberation or are we speaking words of prohibition? Are we extending our hand to people in tangible ways, embodying the reality that we see proclaimed? The second question our gospel text poses to us is, do our gatherings as a, as a church, both here and across the land, help restore people to a renewed sense of health, body, mind, and spirit that then empowers them to give glory to God? That is the important caveat. We are not just interested in liberation. We are not just interested in justice in and of itself, but a liberation and a justice that is defined by how it enables and empowers people to glorify the God who touches the oppressed. We have not been called to fix the world's problems. That is not the end game. We have been called to participate in God's redeeming work which then increases our capacity to see God more clearly as the woman stands up straight and sees the one who has healed her and then responds by glorifying God. Her life 
was not only the sight of God's power in a passive way, but that divine activity in her life gave her greater capacity to worship and to stand up straight. For Jesus, the place of worship was not a space to be guarded by walls of prohibition, but rather it was the liberating grounds for restoration and worship. How often do our communities use prohibition to mark out the boundaries of our space rather than characterize our space as the place where, tr where true restoration and liberation can occur? Now, while there is definitely a need for wise use of prohibition, ultimately, no amount of prohibition will stir the human soul to give glory to God. Are we seeing greater and greater expressions of worship within our communities? You will know them by your fruit, Jesus says. And the, the ultimate fruit of our work, uh, whether it's the prohibitions or the liberation, is our people growing in their capacity to give glory to God. I'm not implying that we are not. I think that we are. I want to imply that the more fundal, fundamental question is not what we don't allow, but does our use of power and authority, whether on prohibiting or enabling, enable and capacitate people and lead people to greater expressions of glorifying God. We are at the beginning of a school year, and I'm reminded of the vocation of teaching, and that that vocation happens in institutions like Milligan and Emanuel and ETSU and uh, also our, our high schools and middle schools and elementary schools, but it's also this vocation of teaching falls upon pastors, Sunday school teachers, parents, also people in positions wherever you are imparting your knowledge in a way that is supposed to be helpful. Uh, so that goes now then extended, extends to doctors and lawyers and caretakers. We all have been entrusted with a certain level of power in our positions to teach and to educate. And then the question is, are we using those powers to restore goodness to people? Are people growing in their capacity for liberation, for standing up straight, for embracing a fullness of their humanity, or are they being bent over and conformed to our own image? We also have, all of us are in positions of more institutional authority, um, whether that is the institution of formal learning or the institutions uh, within the church. And we have to ask, are the, inst are the institutions that we have and the authorities that we've been given, is it empowering us to see those who are marginalized, who could easily be overseen by an institution? Are our institutions enabling more and more people to come to a sense of integration and wholeness? Is there an increasing amount of a desire to glorify? Or do we see our uses of authority and power leading people to disintegration and lament? That might be a clue as to which power we're reaching for, the power of Christ or the power of the synagogue leader. In the years to come, we may have to alter some of our beloved traditions of worship, some of our institutions of power, in order to be a more faithful expression of the kingdom of God. And the goal of our worship is not to give you warm, fuzzy feelings or to speak to you in ways that are necessarily immediately applicable. But first and foremost, our worship is a response to the active presence of God in our midst. Our central, our central point of our worship service is around this table, and the old term that we use for it is the Eucharist meal, which means Thanksgiving meal. And to give thanks means we are giving thanks to an action that has already happened. What is crucial about how we are formed around this table is we come together as a people in response to God's presence already with us, in response to God's action already among us. And so the question is, is your soul being cultivated in such a way 
where you're able to see and sense this presence of God and the moving of God? Is your soul growing in a greater and greater capacity to give thanks? Is our community growing in its capacity to see, to notice, to utter, and to integrate? Is our community in participating in these acts of God, or is our community perpetuating powers that seem to have their end game in dissension and fragmentation and oppression? The writer of Hebrews, which we heard this morning, talks about things of the earth being shaken. And we live in a time when things seem to be shaking. But the, parts, the, but the part of this shaking indicates a shaking of what shackles us. Oppressive powers of coercion and dominance. And the halls of power are definitely quaking. But the church needs not quake. Because as the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, this indicates the removal of what is shaken so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And the writer is referring to the kingdom of God and the body of Christ. As he goes on to say, we have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire, a darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to him. But the untouchable has drawn near and touched us with his humanity. Institutions across the globe, religious and otherwise, are being shaken. And the question is, what is shaking? And the institu institutions that are grasping for power and perpetual dominance and coercion will not remain. And as the writer of Hebrews closes out this section, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, what do we do? Let us give thanks, by which we offer God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. May we be consumed by this unquenchable fire of love and find new ways of opening ourselves up to this love and new ways of extending this love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of response is found in your hymnal, hymn number 670. Rise up, O saints of God. Let's stand, join our voices together, and sing. among us, guests among us, and uh, we want to let you know that we're, we're going to be having an agape meal at the end of this service next week. Uh, that's just a potluck meal. If you can bring something, that's great. If you can't, come anyway. We'll, uh, we'll have a, a meal during the noon hour immediately after this service. Our set, uh, Wednesday table uh, is our Wednesday evening midweek meal. 
That's going to be uh, starting up on September the 7th, so we're still a couple weeks away from that. Uh, a couple of announcements. There's a, a paper in the bulletin. If you'd like to join a small group and be a part of a group from your neighborhood uh, that gets together for prayer and conversation, please fill that out. Let us know uh, where you live and how to get a hold of you, and we will certainly get you signed up for that. And then finally, we are collecting stories from the Hopwood uh, community as well. Uh, we're doing this as a way of discovering who we are and what we value. And uh, if you would go online, you'll find the link to the uh, survey, nine questions, in, uh, in the bulletin today. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Yes. Shifting our um, schedule for the, the, the afternoon on Sunday in attempts to try to make it a little bit easier for people. So I believe it's choir, adult choir meeting at 4? Or probably next week. Next week, okay. Uh, then disregard that. Um, but the youth are meeting um, from 5 to 6 uh, throughout the rest of the semester. Um, that, that will be both elementary age and middle school and high school. The middle school and high school are gonna to meet to do some service work outside, so dress accordingly. Um, and that again is from, from five to six, so. Let's pray together, shall we? Send us forth with your love and your blessing, Lord. May we hear words of liberation and may we liberate others. We uh, give you praise and thanks for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing our closing dismissal chorus together. Now unto in the great love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the peace and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Yes. Go right ahead, Norma. See you tonight.
Ian takes it. Two. I didn't drink all that. I just filled up with stuff from the garden. You want any of these songs? Okay.